Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be here and grateful for the opportunity to share with you. Um, I, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, and I was not in any way interested in academic things. You'll have to take this completely by faith now, but I was an athlete back then. <clears throat> and my interest in academics was only in staying eligible. I didn't know how to spell it, but it meant everything to me. So I went on to college, but in the beginning of my freshman year, I became a Christian. I heard the gospel. I read through the Bible that year because I felt it was a book I should know if I'm a Christian, and my mind woke up. I started sharing the gospel with friends because I thought everybody in the world would want to know that they could leave behind the insecurities of trying to understand who they are by looking at how other people perceive them and understand instead how they are by virtue of how God perceived them and God loved them and did everything to reconcile them into relationship with him, forgiving their sins at great cost. I, I don't understand why a person wouldn't be intrigued by that message. As I would share Christ with people, they would ask questions. I didn't know the answers to the questions. And I would see in the literature the name C.S. Lewis popping up. I started uh, <clears throat> reading to give answers to my friends, but my older sister was teaching fifth grade, and she was a Christian, and she was reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to her fifth grade students, and she told me the story of that book, and I was intrigued. I went and bought the set of the Narnian Chronicles, and that was my first exposure to Lewis, but those weren't the books that hooked me. I read Surprised by Joy afterwards. And when Lewis talked about the deep longing of the heart and the quest for the object of this longing, that book gave me a vocabulary to my own soul, and I started reading Lewis voraciously after that. When I graduated from college, a friend wisely said, you do not get an education in college. All you do is lay a foundation for one. And commencement means you will now commence your education by building on that foundation. Pick an author who will take you places and make that author your life study. I picked Lewis. And I started reading him and discovered that he opens more than wardrobe doors. 73 books, 11 literary genres. He wrote one book called English Literature in the 16th Century, Excluding Drama. And to read that book, to write that book, he read every book written in English in the 16th century. He read every book translated into English, whether it be translated from the Latin, from the Old French, or Old Italian. And he would read it in the original and in translation. Again, this underscores, that's just one of 73 titles, how wide-ranging he is and the doors he opens up. In our time together this weekend, we want to look at just one of his books, Screwtape Letters. And the way I've tried to uh, set our lectures out six times together, I, I want to look at first the background for this book and what Lewis was trying to do in speaking of rich and complex themes in, in fiction a literary fiction. Um, I want to next look at hell, the doctrine of hell, or at least a Lewisian understanding of hell, so that we could understand the background from which the letters are written. And then I want to look at three major themes that run through these letters and, 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 and are exhibited in several of the different letters. And then finally, our last time, I want to look at an, a, an antidote to screw tapes wiles and what Lewis might say about how we can protect ourselves against uh, various forms of temptation. So that's, that's where we're going to go. So first let's look at some background to the screw tape letters. Um, Lewis came up with the idea for the screw tape letters as he was leaving his church, Holy Trinity in Headington, after a Sunday morning service. I can't help but wonder what that sermon must have been like that particular Sunday morning. The concept for the book, as many of you already know, is that there is one devil, a senior devil, named Screwtape, writing letters to his nephew Wormwood on how to trip somebody up, tempt them, and cause them to, one, not come to faith, or if they come to faith, how to, how to stumble. Um, Lewis was going to write a sequel to this book and felt it only right that he do so. He was going to write a book featuring an angel who's writing to a nephew angel on how to elevate and encourage somebody else. But Lewis gave up on the idea realizing that it's easy to get into the mind of the diabolical and virtually impossible to get into the mind of the angelic. 
Lewis had written this. I had, moreover, a sort of grudge against my book for not being a different book, which no one could write. Ideally, Screwtape's advice to Wormwood should have been balanced by archangelical advice to the patient's guardian angel. Without this picture of human life, it's lopsided. But who could supply the deficiency? Even if a man, and he would have to be a far better man than I, could scale the spiritual heights required, what answerable style should he use? For the style would really be part of the content. Mere advice would be no good. Every sentence would have to smell of heaven. Who could ever write that second book, you see? But Lewis actually did do a sequel, and I see you have my friend Marge Mead coming to speak about that particular book. It was Letters to Malcolm Chiefly on Prayer. But it's less pretentious because it's one spiritual struggler writing to a friend, fiction, fiction letters again, that form, but writing to a friend as two pilgrims are making the walk trying to grow closer to Jesus. But how could anybody, the real question would be, become a truly authentic person even? How do we, it opens up all kinds of discussion for us. How do we become an authentic person? Years ago, John Stock came to Wheaton College. It was the last time he came to speak to the students. 2,500 gathered into Edmund Chapel to hear him speak. He spoke for 15 minutes and fielded questions from the students. One student said, Dr. Stott, how do we reach the postmodernists for Christ? And Dr. Stott gave a very tight definition of postmodernism and deconstructionism. It was that simplicity, the other side of complexity. My experience is more people talk about postmodernism than actually read about it. It's like the student who was once asked, have you ever read War and Peace? And he said, no, but I read, wrote a book report on it once. <laughs> and then Stott said, the way to reach a postmodernist for Christ is to be an authentic person. And as soon as he said that, I went into existential despair because I'm not an authentic person. I believe in the high ideal of love, but I've had sharp words with people I say I love most in the world. I believe in justice, but there have been times I've been unfair in my treatment of others. I didn't set out to be, but realize in retrospect I had. How do you become an authentic person? As I shuffled out of the auditorium, I started thinking to myself, you know what, I think maybe there's only been one. Only one person could say, I have lived my life the way it was intended to be lived. As Pascal said in the poem, say, not only do we know God through Jesus Christ, we know man through Jesus Christ as well. And so we look at him, and the question begins to change. How does an inauthentic person begin to approximate authenticity? And I think it's by being honest about our inauthenticity. And when C.S. Lewis writes the screw tape letters, he holds up a mirror and allows us to see ourselves as we are and allows us to begin hungry to enter into that realm of authenticity where we see our great need and it sends us questing for the one who can meet us at the place of our desperation. Uh, Lewis's remarks in the preface to the second printing of the screw tape letters would uh, uh, vector us in that direction. He said, some have paid me an undeserved compliment by supposing that my letters were the ripe fruit of many years study of moral and ascetic theology. They forget that there is an equally reliable though less creditable way of learning how temptation works. My heart I need no others, showeth me the wickedness of the ungodly. You have to treat, appreciate the humility of that comment. And this comment actually underscores Lewis's excruciating honesty as he writes these letters and also how painful it is to read them. At least that's my experience. I don't know if it's yours. For in the letters, Lewis holds up the mirror of what Tolkien called scorn and pity, which is always the mirror that should be held up to humankind. Scorn because of our fallenness, pity because of the dignity of having been made in the image of God, and yet so deficient in that area, yet hopeful because we can move towards growth in Christ when we acknowledge seriously our need and come to God the place of grace. I'll talk more about that at the end of our time uh, in this lecture. Lewis uses imaginative literature to communicate truth. Um, and this is something that we see throughout the corpus of his work. In the preface to Screwtape Letters, Lewis observed, every ideal of style dictates not only how we should say things, but what sort of things we may say. This concept appears in many of Lewis's books. 
Um, he writes in a preface to Paradise Lost, it's easy to forget that the man who writes a good love sonnet need not only be enamored of a woman, but also to be enamored of the sonnet as a literary form. The sonnet and what the person wants to say somehow come together. Uh, Lewis says that he writes children's books because children's books said best what he wanted to say through those particular books. He's longing for the form that will work. And the letter as a literary form lends itself to advice giving. Not only that, these particular letters are in the form of satire. Now generally satire uh, is a risky thing for an author because the satirist is always looking condescendingly at the culture from which he or she comes and looks down as if somehow the author is above the fray. But Lewis writes a form of satire called satire manque, which is always the reminder that the author himself is part of the problem. If you'll remember the great divorce that Lewis wrote, it's also a satirical book. Lewis finds himself in hell and he finds himself on a bus to heaven, or at least the threshold of heaven. And he describes despicable people on this bus. And just as they get to the threshold of heaven, and the light of heaven comes streaming into that bus, Lewis looks down the aisle and sees the mirror in the front of the bus and sees his own face reflected back. That, that's the kind of satire Lewis writes. It sees the foibles, but it doesn't forget. It doesn't forget. Um, Lewis also saw the value of the imagination as a means to speak of the spiritual life. In The Allegory of Love, the book that established his literary reputation, he noted that allegory has always been the literary form directed towards speaking of the spiritual life. In other words, the use of imaginative literature. Um, the word definition is an interesting word. It literally means of the finite. We define a thing by virtue of its limitation, and its function. I can talk about the book because the book could be distinguished from the podium, the microphone, the notes, and so on. A thing has to be small enough to wrap words around it in order to define it. But if that's true, how do you define God? If he's infinite, how do you speak of the infinite? And basically what we have to move towards is something very different. We have to move towards similitude. Jesus, when he's speaking of the kingdom of heaven, says, the kingdom of heaven is like. And Jesus himself used figures of speech, parables, stories, metaphors, and so on. Um, <clears throat> consequently, even the medieval scholastics spoke of the way of analogy to speak of God. And Lewis observed that getting to know God uh, was like taking bearings on the bright blur. He gets brighter and less blurry. Walter Elwell, the theologian, said, all theological work is a work in approximation, and we seek better and better approximations. Um, I tell my students, there are no last words about anything. They almost drift into existential despair at that moment. And I say, to say there's no last words doesn't mean there are no sure words. We can have a sure word about something, but we never have a last word about it. Any truth we know, even, can still be plumbed more deeply it has applications we've never considered, and it could be understood in some sort of coherent relation with other truths. And so I think Lewis, with the, the use of the imagination to describe things of God and things of the spiritual life, helps us avoid the possibility of thinking we've got it all figured out in a formula. The story is a little more um, um, malleable, and so on. But Lewis uses the imagination, and there's always a possibility for abuse of the imagination, of course. In, in uh, his essay, Christianity and Culture, Lewis says, the very road into Jerusalem can also be the road out. What did he mean by that? In James 1.17, we read that every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God is immutable, unchanging. He gives us gifts to woo him to himself. These gifts can never be replacements of God. Matter of fact, it will lead to a kind of idolatry if we do that. But God gives the gifts, and the gifts as he woos us to himself are roads into Jerusalem. But if we make idols of those things, they are the very things that vector us away from Jerusalem at the same time. Um, so consequently, the imagination is a gift, 
but the imagination is a risky gift. It can be abused. We'll talk more about these kinds of abuses as we go through the letters and so on. In the discarded image, Lewis writes about three different uses of the imagination. Actually, I'm, I'm to the place now where going back through the corpus of Lewis's writing, I found 12 different ways that he uses the imagination, the word imagination, 12 different ways. Some of them are positive and some are negative. He talks, for example, about the transforming imagination. And here he speaks of, of Wordsworth, the poet, um, where he'll use the imagination as a kind of projection what psychologists would call uh, projection. He's transforming the reality around him so that he doesn't have to deal maybe with some of his own shortcomings. So he wants to make sure the world fits him. He adjusts the scoliosis of his soul by trying to adjust the universe so that it would reflect his scoliosis rather than adjust the scoliosis of his soul to the plumb line of reality. Um, this feature of the imagination, by the way, of projection is constantly encouraged by screw tape. But there are other forms of the imagination. And since Lewis is using this as a mirror to help us see ourselves as we are and make us desperate for, for grace, we could look at these other kinds of imagination. One that Lewis describes in the discarded image is a penetrating imagination. He believes that Shakespeare and Dante are examples of this and even writes essays about it, variation in the metaphors of Shakespeare or the similes of Dante, where they'll use several metaphors or several similes to get around one thing. It's deep. It has complexity, and so on. Or the realizing imagination he attributes to the medieval thinker, and this is when you try to go wider as well as deeper with the thing. But he also has specific imaginative forms. In one of his essays, he talks about the use of metaphor, and he talks about a pupil's metaphor and a master's metaphor for describing a particular thing. The pupil's metaphor is when you don't know about something and you're saying, okay, what might this be like? And you use a simile or something like this, some imaginative uh, attempt to go beyond your present knowledge. It would be like the scientist's hypothesis, also an imaginative endeavor. And the sci scientists, when they come up with some sort of answer, they then craft models, an imaginative exercise to say it's, it's kind of like this model. It's not a last word on the thing, of course. Um, so you have the pupil's metaphor. The master's metaphor is when a teacher who understands the concept begins to craft a metaphor to bring the students into his or her realm of understanding. I can give you some examples of this. Um, C.S. Lewis in um, uh, Surprised by Joy, uh, again, shows how his own thinking in his uh, faith walk brought him to the place where he had reasoned his way through the morass of atheism and materialism, through agnosticism, uh, and finally he arrived at theism. And he said in that particular book he didn't think he could know God personally any more than Hamlet could know Shakespeare. He argues this the very same decade that Luigi Perandillo, the, the uh, Italian playwright, uh, wrote the play Six Characters in Search of an Author. And the characters in Perandillo's play can't break out of the play to get to know the author, and it ends in despair. But Lewis kind of comes to the same conclusion, the same decade, but a year and a half later, he becomes a Christian, and he revisits the metaphor that he had championed as a pupil's metaphor, and now he revisits it as a master's metaphor, as he uses it in Surprised by Joy to bring his readers along with him. He said, in fact, the analogy was a good one. If Hamlet was ever to get to know Shakespeare, the author. Hamlet, the character, could never break out of the play to get to know him. But Shakespeare, the character, or Shakespeare, the author, could have written himself into the play as Shakespeare, the character, and made the introduction possible. And he said, in fact, that's what happened in the incarnation. It's elegant, isn't it? An elegant image. And it shows, again, Lewis's brilliance at crafting these things to help us see. But that's not the end of the, of, of, of the, of the day. He writes in an essay called Transposition that this is an ongoing exercise. How does the greater communicate itself into the language of the lesser? How does a kindergarten teacher communicate complex thoughts he or she knows so that the children could be brought along and so on? Go back to our metaphor of Hamlet and Shakespeare. Let's all take a field trip and we'll go back in time to Denmark and we'll come to Elsinore. And we'll be talking about the strange things that have been going on in the court lately. The king has died at the height of his strength. And not only that, rather than the crown going to the crown prince Hamlet, it skipped over to the king's younger brother, Claudius. The king's wife hasn't even grieved, and she's immediately married her brother-in-law. There have been 
There's been talk that the king's ghost has been seen at court. Hamlet's been talking with him. And Hamlet's been acting mighty strange lately, though some say there's a method to his madness. And Ophelia's a basket case. And we're courtiers walking through the courtyard, visiting. And all of a sudden, we see this little man in Elizabethan tights with a little goatee and an earring. And we say, who are you and how did you get past the guards into the courtyard? And he says, oh, my name's Shakespeare. I'm actually the creator of your world. I know things have been kind of sketchy lately, but I just wanted to communicate to you that though things have been difficult, I want you to know that things will be getting better soon and all injustices will be set right and I just wanted to communicate that to you. And what do we say to him? Yeah, sure. There's always new work to be done. And with the screw tape letters, Lewis is doing this kind of work. He's using this particular form that he can communicate ideas that we might see something from a, a unique angle, a new angle, and it invites us to see ourselves and our need for grace at that moment. Also, we can note that sometimes fiction works best to penetrate the heart in ways nonfiction cannot. George MacDonald, who was a, a Scottish author who deeply influenced Lewis, he said he never wrote a book where he didn't at least quote from MacDonald or quote an idea from MacDonald. He even did an anthology of George MacDonald's work. Lewis said, uh, or excuse me, MacDonald said in his uh, novel, Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood, we do not have souls. We are souls. We have bodies. If you tell a child he has a soul, he thinks like anything else he has, his books, his keys, his coat, he could leave it behind someplace. He thinks when he dies, he goes to the grave and his soul goes off someplace else. But McDonald says, tell him he is a soul and that when he dies, he goes to heaven and he leaves behind his body like clipped hair on the barbershop floor or old clothes that he's outworn. I don't know exactly what makes up the soul. I've read a lot of literature on it. I think you can prove the existence of the soul and so on. But traditionally, we would say the soul has a choosing part, the will, volition. It has a thinking part, the reason. And it has an emotional part, a feeling part. I would suggest to you, even coming from an academic world, that the reason is by far the weakest part of the soul, the reason. If I make a bad choice, my reason being weak does not kick in and say to my will, that's a stupid choice. You follow down that path, you're just going to hurt yourself and hurt others who care for you. No, instead, my reason being weak, it's marshaled by my will to make all kinds of excuses and rationalizations for that particular uh, choice. We'll look at that in one of the themes that we look at in the, in the letters, because Lewis is constantly talking about what he calls acrasia, the rationalizing of bad behavior. If I'm hurt emotionally, my reason doesn't kick in and say, boy, Jerry, you need to really grieve that particular thing, and you need to untether from that person who hurts you. And grieving, you must also forgive them so that you'll be set free, as Anne Lamont and in her book, Traveling Mercy, says uh, bitterness is like you drinking the rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. <laughs> and so here's the, the emotion has to be processed and the reason often prevents it from occurring. And so consequently, reason being weak as it is, Lewis says, will often stand sentry over my heart, preventing certain truths to get through Let's say, challenge me that I have to change my will about some issues. Or I have to grieve and forgive about some issues. But the reason has guarded and stands like dragon sentries over my heart. And Lewis says, sometimes the story can get past the watchful dragons. The imaginative literature can get past the watchful dragons in a way some propositional literature cannot. The Bible affirms this, of course. We all know the passage where um, David has committed adultery with his good friend's wife, Uriah, and then um, he ends up engineering Uriah's murder. And Nathan the prophet is now told he has to go tell the king of his sin. I don't know about you, but I'd be a little bit nervous about that particular um, assignment. 
So what does Nathan do? He crafts a story. And he tells the story to the king. And the story gets through where the proposition or the mere prophetic pointed finger might not. And David is humbled by the story. Lewis understands this in the use of imaginative literature. But now let's consider again, screw tape letters as a mere imagined source for spiritual guidance. Lewis, uh, as a spiritual guide, said he was not a theologian. And what he meant by that was he wasn't a professional theologian. He didn't earn his living as a theologian. He didn't do some of the things that theologians do. But he certainly was well-read on theological issues, and in some ways, more well-read, I think, than most theologians. Um, the 16, I mentioned to you the book, English Literature in the 16th Century, Excluding Drama. It took him over a decade to write that book. He wrote it for the Oxford History of English Literature. He called it his O oh Hell volume, Oxford History English Literature, because it took so long. But it was the century of the Reformation. He's the only guy I know that read thoroughly both sides of the Reformation. It's significant. He knew his theology. He knew it better than most. Um, but he was unquestionably a wise and spiritual guide because he not only knew theology, he knew the applications of theology to the struggles of the human heart. And consequently, he becomes a good spiritual director. Um, uh, Paul Ford took all the letters of Lewis and just put the ones that were pastoral advice into a single volume, and you can read through those, and they're, they're tremendous. The screw tape letters are a mirror into our souls. Um, they're like the pond in which Queen Orul of Gloam discovered herself to be everything she hated. They're like the mirror in which Dimer, one of Lewis's best books is Dimer. It's a narrative poem. He wrote it before he was a Christian. And so many of the great themes that appear in Lewis appear in question form in that book, but we find Lewis finding answers in God in the later books. But nevertheless, Dimer discovers himself to be a coward by looking in a mirror. And then, of course, there's Eustace Clarence Scrub. Do you remember him? Voyage of the Dawn Treader. There once was a boy named Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. C.S. Lewis begins that book. That's written by Clive Staples Lewis, who knew nobody deserved to be named Clive Staples Lewis. <laughs> Eustace is the archetypal brat. He has the heart of a dragon under the skin of a little boy. And in the magic of that land, in the voyage of the Dawn Treader, he is actually turned into the very thing he was internally. He's trouble from the get-go on the Dawn Treader. They have uh, processed through a horrible storm. The mast has been broken. They come aground. Eustace, rather than doing work with the others, goes off on this island. And on this island, he becomes a dragon. And looking in a dragon pond, he sees his dragon face and visage, and he realizes all of a sudden the truth about himself. And he weeps and weeps and weeps. It all comes home to him. He goes back to the crew of the Dawn Treader and his cousins, Lucy and Edmund, and he scratches awkwardly in the sand that he's Eustace, having been turned into a dragon. In his changed state, he's able to help them. He helps them revictual the ship. He knocks down a tree, and, and with his hot breath, he tempers the wood and puts it in place as the mast on the dawn treader. He helps them see where sweet water is on the island so they could fill up the, the cistern on the ship. And now they're going to be leaving the next day, and they don't know what to do with the Eustace problem. And it was that night where Eustace, back at the dragon pond and the dragon horde, is encountered by a lion. In recounting, he says, I was bigger than the lion, but I was so afraid of this lion. And the lion said, you must undress yourself. And all of a sudden, Eustace says, of course, dragons are scaly things like lizards and snakes. Maybe I could just shed my skin and be boy again. <laughs> Tremendous effort. He tries. He sheds his skin and looks in the pond and still he's boy. With tremendous effort, he sheds his skin again and looks in the pond and still he's boy. A third time, frustrated, he does it and still, excuse me, he's dragon. Still he's dragon. And knowing he can't undragon himself, he looks to the lion and the lion 
says to him, I must undress you. And taking that dragon claw, he goes all the way through that dragon flesh, all the way to the dragon heart, and gets past the watchful dragon, see? It makes him boy again. It's an act of grace for him to be restored. The look in the mirror, the honest assessment of self, is the first step towards the recovery that can be made by virtue of grace. And in a sort of backhanded way, as screw tape reveals to us the truth of ourselves, he becomes a sort of John the Baptist who prepares us for the coming of Christ. Note, this is not screw tape's intention, and yet it's done nonetheless due to Lewis's craftsmanship of the literary form and his use of screw tape as a kind of comedic character, albeit a very nefarious one. Satan's plans always play into the sovereign purposes of God at the end of the day. And the book ends appropriately with the tempter experiencing great frustration. And this is as it should be. Lewis reminds his readers in a preface to Paradise Lost, God shows his benevolence in creating good natures, but he shows his justice in exploiting evil wills. Whoever tries to rebel against God produces a result opposite to his intention. And Lewis is exploiting the wiles of Satan even by using this particular literary form that we might grow in grace as we encounter what Lewis has to say to us on its pages. In her book, All New People, Anne Lamont uh, tells a story, and in the story, the, the, the context is a discussion of the nature of grace. And the mother of the story asks, what sound does a one-hand clap make? And the answer, of course, is it doesn't make any sound unless it hits another hand. It's mentioned in the book that there's a Japanese proverb, what sound does rain make? And the answer is, it doesn't make any sound until it hits something, an umbrella, a hat, a puddle. And the context is, what sound does grace make? And the answer, of course, grace doesn't make any sound unless it hits something. A deep-seated insecurity and fear an estranged relationship, a broken heart. And as Lewis holds up to us the mirror of scorn and pity in these letters, he brings us to the place where we're ready to be recipients of grace and allow them to, grace to touch us in those very places that have been revealed to us. Lewis's screw tape letters are painted across the larger canvas of Lewis's ideas of hell. And without some background in this regard, one will not make as much of the letters as he might. And this will be the topic of our next lecture.